Over the past six months or so, I've been working on two new modules for Elite Ionic, where I build a real Ionic and Angular application for a real client with a real world use case using modern Angular best practices and test driven development. The entire process, including implementation details of the first four sprints is documented in great step-by-step -step detail in the modules. So to quickly summarize some key points for this project, it heavily uses observable streams and is entirely reactive. There isn't actually a single manual subscribe in the entire codebase. It uses a scalable and maintainable NX style architecture, but we aren't actually using NX for this project, it's just standard Angular and Ionic. Each and every feature was developed with a strict test-driven development approach with Cypress and Jest. And this also includes the Firestore security rules, which were also developed with a TDD process. The Firebase local emulator suite is used to create an easy to use and safe local development environment with easy deploys to the production environment. It implements a CI CD pipeline with GitHub Actions for continuous integration and Netlify for continuous delivery or deployment. And the development methodology in general makes use of agile principles. And I used a sort of pseudo scrum slash Kanban approach that would suit single developers or small teams as well. So all of these points contribute to what I think makes up a professional Angular development approach. But of course, I don't think all professional approaches look like this. This is just one particular example of a setup that I think can sustain a long-term complex project. These kinds of tools and processes are the kinds of things that prevent projects from becoming a nightmare to build and maintain when you are more than a few months into it. So these two new modules have just launched. So if you happen to be watching this video within the first 48 hours, you will be able to grab the launch discount for a lifetime Elite Ionic Pro membership to get access to these two new modules and all other current and future Pro modules on Elite Ionic. Now let's take a look at some of those points I just mentioned in a little bit more detail. So I already have a separate video on the general project management and CI CD process that I'm using. So I'm going to mostly skip over that part. I haven't really changed anything in that regard for this project. So I'll link to that video in the description. So one different aspect of this project is the integration of the Firebase local emulator suite into the development and testing process. So if we just take a look at the package.json file, and if we just take a look at the E2E command, and I'm just gonna make this full screen so it's a bit easier to see, you can see that we're using the Firebase emulators exec command to boot up the Firebase emulators before we actually run the E2E command. And we're doing the same thing here with the start script. We're booting up those emulators so that we can run our project against those emulators rather than the real Firebase services. And if I just terminate this process and just run the E2E command again, you can see that this is triggering the emulators to actually start up. And so it's first going to boot those emulators and now it's running our normal E2E script. So it's gonna build the project now. And if we just wait for that to finish, so now we can see once Cypress launches, we get these little uh, debug messages here. And we can see that it's using both the authentication emulator and the Firestore emulator. And importantly, we're also using a project ID of demo project. And this is an important point. So if you use any project ID for your Firebase project with the emulators that follows the format of demo dash something, it will treat it as a demo project. So this means that all of the emulated services will use a demo configuration. And if there is any attempt to access a real non-emulated Firebase service, it will fail. So this allows us to keep everything completely local, including the authentication, which makes for a fantastic development and testing environment. And another cool thing about the local emulator suite is that you can even launch the UI interface, which by default is going to be on port 4000. And that's going to allow you to interact with your Firebase services in a similar way to using the normal Firebase project console, but this is all just emulated locally. So you can see here that I have the authentication and Firestore emulators active, but you do also have the real-time database, functions emulator, storage, hosting, and PubSub 
emulator as well if you want to use those. So if I go to the authentication tab, you can see that I have seeded the authentication emulator with a test user. So this is convenient for manually testing the application, but it is also what allows my end-to-end -end test to authenticate with the appropriate admin permissions by using this test user. I can also head over to the Firestore tab to add or view any data I like in the Firestore database. So I clear this data after each test run, so it's empty, but if we have this up whilst the tests are running, we can see that data is being added and removed. And if you like, you can also seed the database with a set of data that you want in the test environment by default. So you could imagine if you had a, an app that displays a list of movies or something, you might just want to seed the database with a bunch of movies so you actually have some stuff to interact with. Now, if we open up our environment.ts file, you can see we have a little flag in here that has use emulators set to true. And then this is then handled by our app module file, which is going to check for this flag when it's setting up Firestore and authentication. And if the use emulators flag is set, it's going to use the emulators instead of the actual Firebase project. And another important point here is that for our development environment, we have set that project ID to demo project, but in our production file, it is set to the actual project ID of the real Firebase project. And we also have use emulators set to false. So this means that during development, everything is going to just be using that emulated environment. But when we deploy it, it will switch to the real production environment automatically without us having to do any kind of manual configuration. So now everything we are doing in our tests is going to be running against this emulated environment. And to help create these tests and interact with Firebase, I am using a package called Cypress Firebase which allows me to call a login function to bypass the authentication process. Uh, this application uses a sign-in with Google, which uses that uh, sign-in with pop-up method, which complicates the uh, tests a lot because Cypress doesn't actually have uh, access to the authentication window. So it's not really ideal to have to run through authentication processes in end-to-end -end tests anyway. And this just allows us to authenticate the user and then we can just proceed with our tests as if they have already gone through that authentication process. And another thing that Cypress Firebase allows me to do is to set test data on the database. So you can see here that before each of these tests, I am setting up a test client document in the client's collection. And I also delete any data from previous test runs. So generally each one of these end-to-end -end tests will map to one of our user stories that we have in our project management setup that we are trying to implement in the sprint that we are working on. So this is going to capture the broad high-level functionality that we are implementing from the end user's perspective. And so writing the E2E test is the first thing I will do when working on a new feature. And then I will use the failure from this test to determine what needs to be worked on first. And that is when I will start creating unit tests. So we'll just take a peek at one of the uh, unit test files and I'll run the unit tests as well with npm test. So since I'm using TDD, I will create a unit test first and then implement code to satisfy that test. And I will repeat that process with more unit tests until the end-to-end -end test is satisfied. So the general process goes end-to-end -end test first and then one or more unit tests until that end-to-end -end test is satisfied. And then you can proceed to the next user story, which will have another end-to-end -end test. So this test suite in particular that we are looking at is for the client service. And we're making use of some jest features to mock some things. And then we just have sections in here for each of the individual uh, methods that we're testing from the service. So I'm not gonna go into detail as to how these tests work in this video. I am thinking of actually creating another uh, video where I'll focus on that a bit more, make that exclusively about maybe some interesting things that are happening uh, in this project with its unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. So uh, leave a comment if that is something that you would like to see. But we can see here that in total, this project at the moment has a total of 25 test suites. We've got 186 unit tests and I've closed down the end-to-end -end test now, but I think there's about 
uh, it's probably 18 or so end-to-end -end tests as well. And I also have a separate set of unit tests for the Firestore security rules, which I run with npm run test rules. And I'll just quickly open that up as well so that you can see what these look like. It's very similar to the standard unit tests. We're making use of the uh, Firebase rules unit testing library. And what this is going to do is allow us to test the permissions on our Firestore database. It's going to allow us to test our security rules. So in general, it just follows this format of attempting some operation like a read or a write on a, p a particular collection. And then we're going to assert whether that operation should have succeeded or failed. So for example, we don't want a non-authenticated user to be able to update collections that they are not supposed to be updating. And so we can see here at the moment, I have these five tests, which are testing these rules. And at the moment they are all passing. So this allows us to develop our security rules with the TDD approach because we can define these tests and what is supposed to happen. We can get that test failure. And then after we get that failure, we can go and define our actual security rules to make that test pass. And all of this is also configured to work in the CI environment. So if I just open up my main workflow file here, you can see that we have the Firebase tools being installed, which will allow us to use the Firebase emulators in the CI environment. And then we are also running our end-to-end -end tests, our unit tests, and the Firestore security rules tests in the CI environment as well. So this means that every time we merge some new feature, we are going to be able to see these tests run. I'll just pull up one of the examples here that have already completed. And then we can see whether all the tests are passing or failing through GitHub Actions. And then that is also tied to the little uh, status badge in the readme file as well. Now, if we take a look at the app architecture, you can see that I am using the NX style structure where we sort of break things down into feature data access UI and utils libraries. So we kind of have a folder for each of our features and then a generic shared folder. So I have also done a video on this structure in more depth recently. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll link to that in the description as well. But I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how this architecture has played out once we are now four sprints deep into this project. And so you can see some of our code has landed in this shared folder. So we have a few generic components that have been created. We have this checkbox uh, group component, which is just a custom form input. We have our custom JSON form component as well and another component for rendering JSON data in a nice format. So the largest feature that I've been working on is the clients feature. And you can see we have multiple features within this. And as well as that, we have a store and a service for clients as well. So I'm heavily using component store in this application. Again, I have another video on component store, so I'll link to that if you wanna check it out. But basically this uh, store here is responsible for handling the client state, uh, which at the moment consists of uh, the clients that exist and feedback that has been submitted by those clients. All of the feature components that we see in here are the pages that we're looking at. So everything is basically at forward slash clients in the route. And then these are gonna be sort of sub uh, child routes within that. So we have the dashboard, which is sort of the main entry point. We have a detail page, feedback page, feedback detail, survey page. Uh, and so on. And all this is tied together with this uh, shell component. So that's defining the, the main routes for this feature. And then in some cases we have some of these features which then have even more child routes. So in that case, they handle defining their own routes. And in general, I've been following the sort of smart and dumb component approach. So we have all of our features here, which are smart components. And then I've broken things out into dumb components to keep things simple in these feature components. So for example, if we take a look at the client dashboard page, if we take a look at the template here, we can see that we're using a app client list component to handle uh, displaying the clients. And then so that is defined in our UI folder, which is where our dumb components live. So I can open up this client list component. And this is just its own little uh, self-contained component that we 
uh, at the moment only using in that one page, but it could be easily used with other clients features as well that live within this folder. And then if we wanted to, uh, we could use it more generically as well. So I might end up moving this component from being a client specific UI DUM component into the more general shared UI components. But in general, I'll keep things sort of local to the feature that they belong to and only move it to the shared folder if it is actually being shared. And one more thing I wanted to highlight is that if we take a look at the actual code for a lot of these uh, features that I'm creating, both the smart components and the dumb components, you can see that the pages are all uh, quite small. And this is because we have sort of nicely split everything up into separate components. We've architected it nicely so we don't get these massively large files. I think you can see from the ones we've been looking at, the biggest file so far is just around um, 60 lines, but most of them are sort of in the 20, 30 line region. So even though this application is getting quite complex, everything is still sort of kept nice and neat and organized and easy to follow. So if you're responsible as a sort of outside developer for coming into this project and you know you need to make some change or maybe it's just you yourself come back to this in a few months, everything is gonna be a lot easier to follow and make sense of when it's sort of broken down into these smaller parts. So there is a lot more we could talk about about this project, but I don't want to make this video too long. So if there is anything you want to know, feel free to ask in the comments. And if there is anything people are particularly interested in, I might make another video on that as well. So before I sign off for this video, I want to address one more thing, and that's that a lot of the processes and tests this project implements might seem like a bit much. You might think, uh, do we really need all of that? And we can probably build everything way faster without having these uh, you know, 180 tests and CI environments and so on. So I posted this on Twitter recently as a bit of a joke, but also I think it's pretty close to the truth. Setting up all of this stuff requires an investment in time and effort in the beginning of the project, but the longer the project lives and the bigger and more complex it gets, the more it will pay off. Building apps without a solid testing strategy is probably going to be way faster in the beginning, but eventually things will become difficult and messy, bugs will start being introduced that you won't catch, and making changes becomes daunting because you don't know what you might be breaking in the process. If you don't have a carefully maintained architecture, then making even small feature changes may require paying off a lot of technical debt first, and development speed can slow to a crawl. So if you've ever had the displeasure of working on a project that was already 80% done, we just need someone to finish it off, then you know the pain of this situation. So even though spending time worrying about architecture and tests in the beginning might slow you down initially, it is actually going to be faster in the long term. And I will put one little asterisk there and that is that of course you do need to learn how to test and that is going to slow you down as well. When you're initially learning how to test and do these things, it's going to be even slower because you don't know what you're doing. But you will get the hang of it eventually. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it, just like you get better at development in general. And then once you do have a more solid understanding of it, it isn't going to slow you down so much. And again, in the long term, it's going to make you a lot faster and you are going to build much better quality software. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope you got something useful out of it. Uh, and of course, if you want to check out the new pro modules on Elite Arnic, you can follow the link in the description and I will catch you in the next video.